you. Go for it. Please, Go for it. Thank yep. you. Can I just ask for an update on the um, any the potential sale of the ASIC corporate registry? Uh, well, uh, you'd be aware that the um, deadline for uh, the receival of bids under the uh, final bid phase uh, was towards the end of August, uh, and uh, the outcomes of the uh, final bid phase are currently being evaluated by the department. Again, uh, no decision has been made on um, one way or the other on whether or not to proceed uh, with a, a sale of the ASIC registry services. So beyond that, I invite uh, Mr. Edge to provide further detail. Thank you. <coughs> um, well, uh, Senator, as, as the Minister said, we're, we're currently um, assessing uh, what we received at the conclusion of the final bid phase. Um, that process is ongoing. And uh, the um, uh, next step in that process is to, is to conclude that assessment and provide advice to government. Could I ask why, um, why an equity sale was, or a, flo a float and I, it was ruled out? Well, it's, it's not currently a corporate entity. Hmm. So it's, it's it could currently be. part of ASIC. Yeah, but it could be a corporate entity. Uh, that, that is certainly hmm. a possibility. Okay. But was that the sole reason that, that it was... That it was well, if you out? look at the way we actually framed what we were looking for, yeah. we were looking for private sector interest to, um, mm -hmm. and I'm talking off the top of my head here, uh, to participate in the uh, upgrade um, and you know, enhance services through the ASIC uh, registry. So, I mean, we, we were not looking at... Um, selling a business, we are looking at uh, facilitating a private sector uh, investment okay. in, um, you know, obviously a part of um, ASIC, which needs significant investment and which uh, is um, able to be, um, which is able to attract on, under the right conditions, mm. private sector investment on the basis that value added services uh, can be provided through that, through that service. Okay. Could I ask, with the um, the approach you're going through at the moment, um, is it is it uh, how do you, how would you describe it? Is it a, a formal or an informal expression of interest? Is is it a a, a book build process? Are, are these are there hard and fast bids being being made for different valuations on the business? Um, Senator, it's um it's it's not in any way like a book build process. That's that's more a, a process that you would get for a you know, an IPO or a, um, a share offering. Um, this, is, uh, this is different in the sense that mm. it has been quite a structured process. It's gone through a number of phases um, over the past 18 months or so in terms of testing um, uh, market interest um, around uh, operating the registry. Uh, so really um, the, the point we're at now is we've, we've stepped through those various phases. We have um, uh, just recently finished the final bid process where um, counterparties, bidders, if you like, were um, invited to respond to some quite detailed uh, documents around um, the requirements um, and obviously the, the legal and sort of contractual, proposed legal and contractual documents. So when you say a final, a final bid, as in that's sort of first and last opportunity for these potential bidders for the business? Uh, yes, well, it, as I said, it's gone through a number of phases yeah, and I, it's I now at the that. point where, um, where the, the final bid phase represents sort of something just short of, I guess, the best and final offer. <coughs> um, obviously, depending on what government decides to do, there'll be uh, further mm. processes. And can you, can, you talk, can you tell us how many bids you've, you've received? We haven't publicly uh, disclosed um, that sort of detail because we're obviously now in the uh, point the end of the process. Uh, the outcomes of the final bid phase are currently being assessed and evaluated, and you know, relevant um, decisions will be announced. We're in a position to announce relevant decisions. So, you, you, in terms of uh, potential bid bid valuations, um, did the department provide the information to potential suitors to actually value the business to do forward cash flows and other? EVD, but does and other business evaluations. There, there was uh, there was a, a lot of information provided um, mm. through the bidding process, uh, including uh, some due diligence and access to information that would um, enable the bidders to uh, inform their bids, um, and that has been uh, quite a, a 
uh, detailed process yep. over a number of months. Over 18, over 18 months. Yeah. Has it, did, did the department get their own independent bid evaluation? I should say not bid, evaluation for, for the business? Uh, so we have, um, we have advisors that we've been working very, very closely with in terms of um, uh, all of the commercial aspects of this process and looking at um, uh, you know, the bids, not just in terms, of, uh, in terms of value, but in relation to all of the objectives that the government set for this process. And who were your advisors? Uh, so, well, there, um, there are a couple of parties involved. Uh, mm. So the uh, main commercial advisor is Greenhill. Um, uh, Deloitte have been providing advice to us as well, um, accounting and, and technical advice, yep. technological advice, IT advice, and, um, and our lawyers are Ashurst. Okay, and, and what kind of fees have you had to pay for that advice? Um, we could probably um, give you an indication of, of you know, fees to date. Um, yep. My colleague, Mr Jaggers, might be able to help you with that. Um, Senator Andrew Jaggers, First Assistant Secretary, Commercial and Government Services. Um, did you want to know, Senator, a breakdown by, by organisation, or is that what you're... Oh, if, if, if possible, if it's easy, otherwise just a, just a dollar amount for the what you've had to pay so far for okay. advice on the sale. All right, um, thank you. So, Senator, um, we've um, uh, expended $3.9 million with our commercial advisors, Greenhills. Yep. Our legal advisors, uh, 3.2. We've had uh, probity, probity advisors as well, and we've spent $116,000 on probity advice. And we've um, uh, spent uh, just over two million dollars on accounting and IT advisory. Oh, sorry, accounting advice and six hundred and eighty thousand dollars on IT advice. Uh, four, um, the first was business advisory services, oh, yeah. Thank you. which was um, with Green Hill and Company. Yeah. And I mean, this was previously obviously published on uh, Ostend of when the yeah. contracts were yeah. met and have previously been discussed in this committee. Yeah. Okay, so it's about ten million all up. Roughly, when you add them all, all together. And was that up to the end of the the market testing phase? So, so that's basically expenditure to date. To date. So OK. Yeah. OK. So could you just um, confirm again when, when you expect an announcement to be made, uh, made on this? Or is that ministerial discretion, presumably? But well, um, announcements will be made when we're ready to make announcements. I mean, obviously, uh, and like announcements will be made after decisions have been taken at this stage. I haven't received uh, any advice yet uh, from the department in relation to the recommended uh, way forward. Uh, mm. As the officers indicated, they're going through the evaluation of the outcomes of the final bid phase at present. Um, obviously, uh, decisions will be made after relevant recommendations have been received. Okay. Um, could, could I ask, just, oh, sorry, just in, in relation to, oh, or to you want to go, Senator McKinnon? Oh, yeah. I just had, um, irrespective of the date, Minister, can you confirm for the committee um, the status of the employees working in Tarragon and Latrobe Valley as a result of this process? Well, uh, again, I mean, the government has been consistent all the way through. Uh, all of the uh, bidders, every step of the process, have been made explicitly aware that the government's very strong uh, preference is that we want to see the employees in um, regional Victoria accommodated as part of any um, private sector involvement uh, in the ASIC registry, uh, and that that continues uh, to be the case. Thank you. Could, could I ask in relation to um, expressions of interest where different business models were, were looked at for future sales, or was it just um, going, going concern uh, business as usual. But for example, did you look at um, you know a UK a UK approach, which you know put limits on potential fees, and and, and user charges into the future? I suppose where I'm going with this is my concern, the concern of my party, and I know others. Number of stakeholders have come out to make similar concerns about the potential future charges well, maybe of accessing this database. This is where I might assist you. Um, because there's been a lot of misinformation in relation to this out in the public domain. Firstly, 95% of services provided by the ASIC registry at this point uh, are completely free of charge. 95% of searches 
uh, through the ASIC registry are, conduct, um, are completely free of charge. Uh, fees and charges for the remaining 5% of searches and products are currently regulated and subject to price caps, and this arrangement would continue. <coughs> so in terms of the uh, cost of uh, what is uh, currently regulated service and uh, what is uh, currently provided uh, by ASIC, uh, we, I mean, there's not going to be any change. However, um, the reason we are looking and exploring private sector involvement is that we believe that the services provided by the ASIC registry can be taken to another level, that value-added services can be provided. And obviously, there would be opportunity in the context of uh, value-added services to uh, assess what the appropriate um, you know, remuneration arrangements for those uh, services would be. Could, so, could, could you give me some examples, Senator Cornwell? Well, those no, I services, can't. Those because, evaluated services would well, be. well, I can't because that obviously goes to uh, the uh, evaluation of specific bids that is uh, currently underway. Should the government decide to go down uh, this particular path, uh, based on uh, the recommendations at the end of this evaluation process, then uh, we'll be able to talk through these sorts of um, examples. But at this point. What I, what I can say to you is that 95% of searches currently conducted through the ASIC registry are completely free of charge, and fees and charges for the remaining 5% of searches and products are regulated, uh, subject to price caps, and will continue to be regulated and subject to price caps, and um, so there is absolutely no change on that front in relation to the existing arrangements. So, uh, I mean, you, you know as well as I do, Senator Coleman, Businesses don't buy assets or other businesses unless they can get increased returns, either cutting costs or, or growing revenues. You're trying to say that the primary motivation behind this would be to grow revenues from new, new business development. Say that again. You're trying to say that the primary motivation for any potential buyer of this yep. business would be to grow revenues through new business development. That's right. Yeah. But why would why couldn't they do that with, without? Well, because, I mean, there's obviously why, why a can't you give us well, there's examples? a database here with a certain set of information, and mm. um, you know the, the, the basic premise is exactly as you said. There is a view uh, that the uh, database, uh, that the use of that data, database and the services provided in the context of that database can be enhanced um, compared to what is currently provided through a public sector provider. Now, that is currently whether that is the case or not the case is obviously currently being tested. Um, Will there be restrictions on the privacy, the use of that database? Um, current, yes, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, current requirements will continue to apply. So, can you give us any examples, Mr. Edge, of what the potential new valuated businesses might be? I mean, I, I actually probably should go and have a look and see what market analysts may have said about this, because I'm sure Computer Share and other businesses that are interested in this be pretty clear why they might want to buy it. Um, what would a big, a couple of million people on a database, what would that offer if, if their fees and services were regulated as they currently are? What's the upside to owning that database? Um, Senator, obviously it's, um, uh, there's a number of considerations there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the existing um, IT system um, is, is very dated and uh, has got limited functionality. Some parts of it are more than 25 years old. Um, there's a number of elements of it that don't talk to each other. Um, so the, one of the um, most important um, priorities in terms of um, <clears throat> this process has been an update and a, a modernisation of that, that database. And that in itself will um, enable some, uh, some cost savings in terms of operating the registry, but would also enable uh, services, new services to be offered in, in effect um, uh, services that are currently unable to but, be provided. But you would want to capture that in your sale price, though, surely. So where, where, once again, where would the upside be for a potential bidder? Well, the potential bidder would need to invest in an IT platform right, that so it would, would enable after. it to yep. offer these services. OK, but it's something the government could do and still get the same efficiencies or the same returns for, sh for stakeholders being taxpayers as well, if we chose to go down that road. Uh, in terms of um, in terms of the, the IT platform, that's obviously, uh, I guess, in a sense, agnostic as to who builds it, mm. but um, they're um, obviously with a commercial operator, they would have, um, they would have a, a view to how uh, those additional products and services could be, um, could be sold to the market. 
Mr. Edge, is is the costing uh, a figure that comes to mind is a, a, an estimate for the IT system that's required a hundred million dollars, or what is finance is costing on the replacement <coughs> IT system that's required? It's somewhat more than that. But yeah, it's pretty yeah. significant. I, I think it's it, it is a bit Can, more than that. Well, I, I I think I've read a figure of a hundred million. So, is there any way that you could enlighten me on what the <coughs> The draft estimate, whatever caveats you want to put around it, but just so, to get an idea. <clears throat> so th this is the estimate to uh, this is the estimate to uh, replace the existing systems with a um, modern um, yep. database, um, and that estimate I think is is certainly what we understand is is required. So uh, something. As the minister said, something more than 100 million. Yeah, we might have to take on notice. Something more than 100 more million, precise. but less we'd than infinity. We'd have to, we'd have infinity. to take it on notice. We'd have to take it on notice. But presumably, whether it was 100 million, Senator Gallagher's asking, they're, they're going to expect a decent return on that if, if they're going to rationalise the business. I mean, they're not going to buy it unless they're going to make a good, <clears throat> good return. I um, think that uh, the other thing that's important to remember is the operating costs associated with the 25-year-old Hmm. Um, IT sure. system are pretty significant and yep. that investment will result in significantly lower operating costs as well. I could understand that any potential bidder, if they could do it in-house with their expertise, would save costs, but I wasn't aware that the potential bidders had that kind of you know, IT expertise unless they're migrating onto one of their own platforms. I'm sure well, we could work backwards from that and that's the only thing that makes sense to me. Could I just, my, my last question. Um, uh, perhaps for Senator Cormann, you mentioned the 5% of services that fees and charges are, uh, are charged, uh, which is actually what makes most of the money for the registry at the moment. You said they're going to be regu regulated with, with price caps. Um, that is the current situation. That is the current situation. And, and but can you tell us would that regulation entail price rises over time? Well, I mean... <laughs> Well, that's important. Well, well but the thing you is, may regulate not, it not, not related, not related to this proposal. Obviously, uh, governments of either political persuasion, from time to time, uh, reserve the right to adjust fees and charges for relevant services. Uh, but um, so I'm not saying that there will be, but I'm also not saying that there never, ever in the future uh, will be a change in uh, fees and charges uh, as they, uh, which are adjusted uh, across the board from time to time as appropriate. Now, but they're not charged the, at cost at the moment, are they? They're sorry, they're not charged out at cost at the moment. Uh, the, the company uh, searches, for example. Uh, well, uh, it, it is right to say that it's not just a cost recovery yeah. uh, yeah. arrangement; it goes beyond pure cost recovery. What is also right to say is um, that the, uh, as I've already indicated, uh, the. Uh, searches that do attract a fee or charge um, is for a, a small percentage, 5% of searches and products are currently regulated and subject to uh, price caps and, and these would continue to remain in place as to whether there will be changes to the level of uh, fees and charges into the future unrelated to this particular proposal. Well, that is obviously a matter for governments in the future to consider. But that means that they could be subject to being lobbied by the new entity to raise those price caps. Um, Which is what I would do if I was in their shoes. Well, I mean, the, well, I mean, but the thing is that you're, you're making all sorts of assumptions on how any. Uh, private sector involvement, which hasn't been decided well, on yet, operate. may or may it's not be structured. Operate, Senator Cormann. You, well, you understand that. It, it, you're, you're making assumptions. You're they're making in the assumptions. To make profits for shareholders. That's what they well, do. You're, you're, you're making assumptions. You're it's making a pretty, it's first year economic students would make that assumption. Well, no, uh, I, I don't. Th you're making some assumptions that um, make your conclusions a bit flawed, and uh, and I, I can't go into the future value. I, I can't. I can't go into the detail of all of this because it goes to the structure of any. Um, a proposal that we may or may not decide to proceed with. Okay, but you, just to be clear, um, you can't. We don't know what the future price changes well, are going to be on these these fees and services. I, I can't only. predict the level of fees and charges uh, at some point in the future for any government service that is attracting a fee or charge. Uh, you know, from time to time, relevant fees would, and charges are adjusted. Would, would you admit then, perhaps, that um, an asset like this? this that's in public hands, it's easier to maintain prices and, and price caps in place at a level 
for public access than it would be for a private company? Well, no, because the private company has got absolutely no role in setting regulated prices that are subject you. to they price caps. The decision, that whether, whether it is uh, in public hands or in private hands, uh, regulated prices are regulated prices. Uh, mm. And there's absolutely no difference in the decision-making authority in relation to regulated prices, so, whoever the ownership has. Sorry to be a bit cheeky or a bit cantankerous, but if, if Mr. Edges, I mean, if, if, if the logic is right that a, a, new, a company will migrate a new IT platform, rationalise the business, lo lower their operating costs, perhaps build their business, could, could you say that uh, prices and fees might actually go down if they can do it at a lower, at a lower, uh, a lower cost so their profit margins are higher? Would you... Would it be reasonable to assume that costs are going to come down if the provision of these these costs are actually lower? Yeah. Um, Senator, the, the costs that we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, for statutory products, the, the fees and charges for those are, are, are determined um, by um, by the Treasurer um, through a statutory instrument. and yeah. they. But he's uh, got to base it on something, right? Like, you understand it because you own the business now. But in the future, a private owner, it's going to be a lot different. But the private owner doesn't make the decision on pricing no, in relation to those regulated services. you have to make your decision based on information well, that the private owner will give you. It, that's, that's the logic of what I'm saying. Well, and they're going to say, Senator Cormann, no. we want to get the best return possible for our shareholders. That's how it works. No, that's, well, it's not how it works in relation to this, because as you've already indicated, this is not actually a cost recovery arrangement at present. Uh, the government sets uh, these uh, fees and charges now. Uh, the government would set these fees and charges in relation to those services we're talking about in the future. Uh, so there is uh, no change envisaged on that front. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, Senator Geller. Yeah, I've just got a few on this as well. Um, I, hope, I don't think I'm going to be doubling up on some. But can I just understand exactly what finance's role is in this? Are you the lead? You're the lead department on the ASIC potential sale of ASIC so registry? We, we, we conducted the scoping study and yeah. uh, we uh, are delayed in assessing the opportunity for the private sector uh, to get involved in the uh, upgrading uh, and um, value added services through the ASIC registry, yes. Okay. Um, and so